Because of the way the universe is created, we each of us live in two worlds at the same time. We have to live in the outer life of our own bodies and the inner life of our own souls. Hello and welcome to Living the Inner Life. I'm your host, Chris Sheridan, and I want you to join with me on a journey of discovery into our inner lives with our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, everything that helps shape the way we interpret the outside world and influence the way we respond to it. Now, you may have heard of the ancient practice of alchemy, the dark arts, originally from Egypt that flourished in the Middle Ages, even in Persia during the 13-1400s. And it's known simply as the process of turning lead into gold, base metals into precious substances. Okay, and this was felt to be a real thing by a lot of people. It may have been the precursor to chemistry because it uses chemicals and processes like heating and cooling and separating and a lot of different operations, as they're called, to come up with this elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, which is the gold that gets refined out of the lead. Okay. Now, a lot of people who did believe this weren't ones that really understood it. Some alchemists of the day were taken in by kings or noblemen and basically put into a basement laboratory until they started churning out this gold, and if they couldn't do it, this actual metal, then they were either disposed of or turned out some other way. Okay, but the alchemist, a true alchemist, really understood that what was going on was the refinement of the self, of the individual, the human being, because we all have base levels of thought and feeling and emotions these darker, usually linked with survival at an earlier time in our history, uh, whether it's violence, uh, just despair, darkness, anything you can think of. And we've all experienced that because we go through moods and we are thrown about in different circumstances, different situations, and a lot of them can be very difficult and it can make our lives, or at least parts of it, very dark. And if we don't process older emotions, uh, maybe wounds from childhood, they can fester and later in adulthood become things that really run our lives in a not very good way. Okay, So the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung in the 1940s wrote a book on alchemy and psychotherapy because he felt that there was a very distinct parallel between this ancient art of changing lead into gold and the more modern interpretation of what is also a very ancient art of enlightenment, of transformation. Okay, He called it individuation, or the self with a capital S, starting with a small s self, that you become this greater, larger part of yourself. And to do that, just like in chemistry and alchemy, metal alchemy, to do psychological alchemy or inner alchemy, you have to go through processes too. All right? So I want to first start with a metaphor for alchemy, which actually, in a way, it really is an alchemical process. And that is one of baking a cake. Because what happens when you bake a cake, you start out with different materials and you subject them to these operations, these different processes that they go through and in a certain order, also known as the recipe. And at the end, you have something wholly different, something that doesn't even resemble the initial ingredients. Okay. Maybe if you're making vegetable stew, you can still see the vegetables when you finish making vegetable stew, but a cake becomes something else. Okay, so the eggs have to come from a chicken or some other bird animal uh, where you get this egg protein, and that's a living thing, and it went through a process. Part of the process of regeneration didn't quite finish it because you're using an egg that never really became another chicken. So that's one ingredient. ingredient. Um, You have butter, perhaps. I don't know what your recipe (laughs) entails, but I'll just kind of use a generic standard one, and I 
technically probably don't even know what I'm talking about with this, but I can imagine what baking a cake uh, is like. I've used mixes and things like that, which I guess is sort of cheating, but we're going to try to get uh, at least uh, a sense of what starting from scratch is. So butter, even butter itself, and again, it's close to that regeneration process because it's cow's or goat's milk that is used mainly for feeding younger <laughs> cows and goats. And then the milk itself has to be transformed into butter through churning. So that's an operation. That's something you're doing to the milk to make it into butter. Okay, so you need that. And then you need sugar, which is also taken from a beet or a cane. And it has to be harvested. It has to be cut open. It has to be smooshed up and whatever goes into extracting the sugar from a cane or a beet and then dried out, then you have these grains, this granular sugar to work with. Uh, same with flour. Flour has to be grown as a wheat product, a wheat plant, and then it gets killed. It gets hacked down, reaped at the harvest and further separated the wheat part from the chaff, the stuff you don't want. And then that gets ground up and dried and then you have flour. So we have all these ingredients and that's what an alchemist would have to work with. Sometimes known as the prima materia, the first materials that you have to work with. And in the case of metal alchemy, it would be lead or other base metal. Okay. So what happens is then you take these ingredients and you further subject them to different processes. Okay. So you'll whip up the egg. That's a process that you do. Um, water, part of life, gets poured in. And you mix the sugar and the flour and some other chemicals, I guess they're chemicals, ingredients. Uh, be baking soda, perhaps, maybe baking powder. I'm not sure. I think baking soda is one of the things. I'm not even sure what it is, but it's, it's something that you have in your shelf. And you have to put it in the cake. For some reason, it does something that somebody figured out a long time ago. And it seems to work if you follow the recipe. Okay, and that would be a formula that an alchemist would use in the kitchen. And we just call it a recipe. So in order you mix these things together, that is another operation. And when you wind up uh, with this cake batter, it's consistent and it doesn't resemble really anything that was put in there, even though it's all those things mixed together. It's this kind of undefinable mush and you want to get it mixed evenly so it's consistent in its liquid and solid capacity. It's this kind of goopy stuff. I'm sure you probably know what I'm talking about. And then it gets poured into cake pans and put in the oven. Yet another operation, this heating, this element of fire that goes into it. And you have to put it in the oven like you would a metal in a crucible. Okay, you want to contain this heat around the cake pans. Okay, so and you want to measure it to make sure that it's at a certain time, certain length of time, and at a certain temperature that will turn this cake batter into a fluffy cake. And you pull it out and you cool it down and you put it together and then you have icing, which is another recipe that you're going to make again with sugar and some other things. And then you have a cake and it resembles nothing like the ingredients really taste like nothing, like the ingredients. And it's something wholly different, but it's completely made of those ingredients. You didn't really bring in anything else. You only used the ingredients on the list and you put them through the process of these operations uh, that are called for in the recipe. And there's certain amounts, there's measuring, there's all this stuff and then cooking it, cooling it, icing it, and you have this cake. So it's been completely transformed. It's been transmuted from one group of ingredients to now you have a whole, and you have a singularity. All these ingredients were separate and they came from different parts, either of the world or of the farm or the grocery store, wherever you pick them up, or even in your kitchen. They're in different, you know, one's in the pantry, one's in the fridge, one's somewhere else. So you have this resulting product, what an alchemist would call the elixir of life or the philosopher's stone, and that is this universal medicine that can cure anything or anyone, or like the metal 
metaphor, that would be the gold. And there's something really interesting about the metal that's used in metal alchemy as a metaphor. And I'm getting to that. Uh, and that is that lead is cheap in a way. It's kind of you know, lead poisoning. Uh, it can be poisonous if you get around too much of it or eat some of it. It can be, or at least have a toxic effect on you. And it's soft. It's, there's a lot of, it's heavy. Right? I mean, it's literally heavy. People use lead weights to fish or to scuba dive or do all kinds of things. And then gold is this much more valuable product. It's much more resilient. It doesn't tarnish this metal. It's a great electrical conductor. That's why it's used in computer circuits and spacecrafts and things like that, scientific instruments. Okay? And it's fully its own thing. If you melt gold down a thousand times, it'll still be gold. Okay, so it really doesn't, once it's become gold, it doesn't really change, of course, unless you make an alloy or something like that. But the gold itself is gold, and it's valuable, and it's bright, and it's shiny. doesn't tarnish, okay? So, like baking a cake, like turning lead into gold, the true alchemist, the inner alchemist, which, by the way, is you, is one who takes the lower parts of your personality, of your ego, of your organism, your physical body. Not that they're bad, because that's what you're starting with. Okay, And to go through this alchemical process of transformation, when you're transforming your emotions, you can go from the darkness to the light. You can be somebody who's a downer, somebody who's difficult to be around, somebody pessimistic, and you can be a lighthouse that everyone can be attracted to, somebody who has light to share and to shine and to give to others, and has this value, your life, yourself, your purpose, your meaning will have more value. But you go through this transformation. So just keep in mind that as we talk more about this, you are starting out with everything you need, okay? All the ingredients are there. And if they're not there, they're easily attainable. Okay, you probably have to maybe dig a little bit inside to pull them out. Maybe you have to go back at a time in your life when you were lighter, perhaps younger and free. If now you're feeling older and constrained and cynical, perhaps maybe very self-conscious, a lot of self-doubt in your life, you may have to pull in your memory banks to that time when you were how you want more to be like now, because that can help inform where it is you want to go. And it's honestly, it's not easy. But Jung went through, Carl Jung went through all these processes in alchemy, like I kind of described with the cake, and thought, well, that's what we need to do with our psyche. This is a metaphor, a very symbolic representation of what we need to do inside. Okay, and to spend a note or a minute talking about that, that's why we have rituals, whether it's a pageantry, a dance, or any other kind of ceremony with regalia and masks and, you know, all kinds of you know, music, all kinds of things. It's a very outer thing in a lot of ways, okay, but it's to get something going inside, Okay, we need to do this outer thing to make an inner change. I know this is living the inner life, and I talk about how change has to come from within uh, so that you can influence and improve your condition and your relationship with the things in and around you. But to do that, we sometimes have to do, and maybe not sometimes, maybe most of the time, we have to do something outside because we are physical beings. We do live in a physical world. And doing this other thing, this physical thing, is a way of engaging more of your senses because you're, you're involving your body and your mind and you're doing things out here. The wor real work is being done inside, but to do that work, you need to do something outside, okay? Like the hero's journey in myth and in movies, 
Uh, Joseph Campbell is a great one to read, his power of myth, and a hero with a thousand faces. That this journey, say like uh, the Odyssey, you know, if you go back in mythology to one of the greatest epic tales, you know, Odysseus has fought the Trojan War and won, and he's victorious, and he's been this warrior his whole life. He goes out, and it's conquest. He's a very much outer person, living his life very defined by his adventures. And the Odyssey is about his journey home, back to Ithaca. And along the way, he encounters all kinds of trouble, all kinds of difficult creatures. He loses his ship. He loses his crew. He almost loses his life. And he loses about 10 years to take this journey that should have only taken a few weeks. And what that does is that strips away parts of him inside. He has to become something else when he returns than he was when he left. He can no longer be the conquering warrior that goes off to battle when his role now is to return to Ithaca, marry, be with his wife, Penelope, and his son, Telemachus, and be the sort of philosopher king of the nation state of Ithaca. Okay, very different. Now, it's leadership, so there are some similarities. You know, and, and somebody who's powerful, somebody who's good at what they do. Uh, but it's a different kind of leader. It's a different kind of person. So he could not return to Ithaca the same person he was when he left Troy at the end of the battle or any of his other battles. He had to be fundamentally different, okay, changed by this journey. And yes, it's epic. And there was all kinds of sea monsters and Poseidon and the gods and the goddesses, Athena. Everybody seemed to be involved in this epic tale because it is, it's the most epic of all, really. And that was all necessary for him to change on the inside. So when he did return, he was the right person at the right time to fulfill the role that he needed to be from that point forward. Okay, so that's just a little exploration into why we need to do these outer things to make an inner change. It's also good because we can see them. Okay, if you're just going to close your eyes and say, well, I'm going to transform myself, I'm going to change my thoughts into better thoughts, you're, you're kind of caught in this airy thinking and feeling state where sometimes it doesn't really take hold until you involve your body a little more. Like we're talking about habits or memorizing a piece of music or a speech. You have to do that with your mechanism, with your organism, <laughs> with your material body and your hands and feet and mouth and anything else you need to move around um, to do this, that you can change inside. They're very much related. They're very connected. And in movies, we call this the outer goal, which is the journey, the actual journey, and the inner need, okay? And at the beginning of a movie, the hero has an inner need that has not been fulfilled, and there is an outer goal to be accomplished. And it's, they seem to be running along parallel, not really interfering or connecting with each other. They seem like separate things, but there's always this point in a movie and other epic tale or mythic wisdom story where they clash, where they come together, that the only way the hero can achieve the outer goal is while simultaneously fulfilling this inner need. And they can run up against each other, and there can be all kinds of problems. Of course, there are, because this is a test of trials and tribulations to become something else, okay? Just like the lead becomes something else, becomes the gold. Just like the flour and baking soda, whatever that is, and all these other ingredients, and the heat becomes the cake, okay? So this is inner alchemy, and I will probably do a much larger piece, probably a multi-part um, seminar, I guess, uh, or series of talks on inner alchemy, because it's a real big deal, and it is such a great metaphor for what we have to do in our inner lives with the ingredients, with the stuff of our psyche, our contents of consciousness, if you will, 
And these operation, these things that we need to do, if it's meditation, breathing, even exercise, physical exercise, can do great things for your inner life. And then what we become is transformed. The small s self becomes the capital S self. Okay, it's individuation. You become a fully whole person. The two become one. These disjointed parts of ourselves get reintegrated and transformed into something we need now. Okay, and you can make this transformation or go through this inner alchemy many times in your life. But a lot of times there's kind of a big one, maybe at midlife or a little bit before, a little bit after, where you say, wait a minute, I really have to make a big change. The things that you need to change at this point are the things that have needed to change for a long time. A lot of them are things that worked then, but don't work now for the person and the role that you have to fulfill at this time. Just like Odysseus had to be this warrior and go off to battle and do all these things to be a successful military leader, conqueror, he had to strip that transform that, cut it, shave it off, boil it down, you know, cook it, <laughs> whatever he had to do. I'm kind of mixing the metaphors with the, with the cake uh, to become this something else that he now needed to be. So look at yourself. Find out, are you working under an older paradigm that needs to be transformed? And the answer is usually yes, especially at midlife. Anytime in your 30s, 40s, 50s, that you want to make this change, it's a great time to do it. You may have to accept the fact that the way that you operated up until this point, no matter how well that served you, no longer will, okay? Because you're no longer the person that you were, and you're no longer doing the things in the same way that you did back then when you first developed these skills. So even though they had suited you up until this point, for this purpose and meaning in your life now, they will have to be transformed. Seems like they're being destroyed, but they're being fulfilled, okay? They're being refined into a much more useful, a much lighter what part of yourself, your soul from being dark and leaden to being refined and golden and shiny and untarnished and very, very valuable. Okay, because you're worth it. You have the material. And through this podcast and other great teachers, not that I'm a great teacher, but other people who are much better teachers than I throughout history have talked about this in some way or another, this process of transformation, personal transformation, psychological transformation, spiritual unfoldment and liberation and enlightenment. And that's what we do here on the inner life. We are living the inner life. We are inner alchemists. And we are the lead that becomes the gold. We are the goal. And through this process of internal transformation, inner alchemy, we can become the golden, untarnished, shining, and very, very valuable people and individuals that we are. And so are you. And thank you. I know you value your time and I value you being here, listening to me and sharing this time together. Let me know what you think in the comments and we'll see you next time here on Living the Inner Life.